to just bring us this far. I am so grateful to be on with you. I'm grateful for this Bible study. I'm grateful for manifestations of his grace and of his mercy. I am so grateful that we serve the God who made heaven and earth. You know, the people in, in, in old times served a lot of different gods. They served a lot of idol gods. They served statues and animals and they served the sun, the moon, the stars. They served all kinds of things. And so the God in heaven would attach, would attach things about him. So when people were worshiping, they would know that they were worshiping the right God. So he would refer to himself many times as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that way, when you said those things, the people who were listening knew that you were not worshiping an idol God. He referred to himself as the God of Daniel, the God of David, the God of the Israelites. He referred to himself as God of the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath. Just different ways for him to identify himself. Throughout the Bible, you will often see a term, it goes like this, the God of heaven and earth and the sea and all them in them is. And you'll see God of heaven and earth. So what he's telling you is, I'm the one up here and I also control down there. I am so grateful that that's the God that I serve. I'm grateful. He is all powerful, almighty, magnificent. He is sovereign. There is nothing in the universe that does not give way to him. Man, man, man is the only stubborn thing. We'll get to him last. But the, the stars give way to him. The mountains give way to him. The clouds, the sun. There's no earthly ruler who can compare to him. I don't think we understand what kind of power it takes to make a world. The Bible says he spoke and it stood fast. It says mountains skip out of his way like rams or little lambs. At the very presence of God, he put his foot into the water and the Red Sea cleared a dry path. Man cannot make anything like God. He cannot. The Bible says that Solomon, arrayed in all of his beauty, could not compare to a lily of the field. Solomon had gold everywhere. The Bible says he was the richest king that ever lived. But when we get to heaven, the richest king that ever lived never had streets made out of gold. The richest earthly king cannot compare to our heavenly father. No comparison. So I'm grateful today to be on this line with you. I'm grateful to talk to you about his love and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness. I once heard somebody complain that it's not fair that, that we've only got one way to reach out to God and that's through prayer. And I said, can you imagine? You don't have any way to reach the president of the United States. You don't have any way to reach the guy who's running United Nations, no way. They will never take your call. But my heavenly father always takes my call. And guess what? I can always get on his calendar. Every week he and I have a special appointment. Every week he says, I'm waiting, I'm here. And he asks us to show up. And so often we show up on a different day. Can you imagine your job say, be here on, on Monday and you show up on Thursday? You'd be out of work. So today we talk about the Sabbath, the first and last test of loyalty. It was the first test of loyalty. It will be the last test of loyalty. It was first and that God, when he made it, was the very first thing that he did for man. Very first thing, he gave him his Sabbath. And right before he comes back, all of us will be tested on that very same thing. The book, the first chapter and the last chapter will look the same. So let's get into it. Father, be with us. Holy Spirit, cover us on this Bible study. Educate us, teach us, convict us, persuade us, and lead us into all righteousness. Amen. So the law, uh, the law of God was challenged in heaven. It was challenged in heaven. Who challenged the law of God in heaven? Anybody know? The Bible said that there was war in heaven. According to Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9, it says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. 
and they lost their place in heaven. Now, guess where the devil got, got sent when he got kicked out of heaven? The Bible says the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, which leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth and his angels with him. He got thrown down here. And the Bible says he leads the whole world astray. The only way we will not be led astray is that we have the Bible, the word. The Bible says that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. This is the only thing that's going to keep us on the right path. It is the only thing that the Bible says is truth that we have. Truth. There was a great controversy or conflict. And all humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. Those are the three things that Satan challenges God on every minute of every day, every second, and every place on the planet. His character, his law, and his sovereignty. The conflict originated in heaven when a created being endowed with freedom of choice and self-exaltation became Satan, the adversary. God's adversary and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. The Bible says one third of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world, which he led Adam and Eve when he led Adam and Eve to sin. This human result, this human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disordering of the created world and its eventual devastation at the time of the global flood as presented in the historical account of Genesis chapter one through 11. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of universal conflict. Right now, some of you are getting ready for the Super Bowl. Do you not, do you not know that the Super Bowl is a, a microcosm of the struggle between good and evil? Did you not know that? That the home team wears white, they represent good. The away team represents evil and they wear the dark colors. They, there is an arena and everybody around is watching. The people watching are not playing. There are very few players, but plenty, plenty of people watching. And everything is at stake with every move. Every side has a coach giving them instructions, telling them what to do, trying to help them get one up. Every time you go to a football game or a basketball game or a soccer game or a hockey game, I want you to know that that is a microcosm of the struggle between good and evil. Observed by the whole creation, this world becomes the arena of universal conflict out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated to assist his people in the controversy. Our coach, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide protect and sustain them in the way of salvation. How does sin get started, everybody? The Bible says that pride was the foundation of sin. Pride was the foundation of sin. In Ezekiel 28 verses 12 to 18, it talks about Satan. It says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all that you did from the day that you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your rich commerce led you to violence and you sinned. So I banish you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of your beauty, your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. Y'all got to be careful. When you are in arenas with people, it's all about them. When they have flowing robes and flowing hair and covered in jewelry. That was Satan. The Bible says that every precious stone was his covering. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. You defiled your sanctuaries, with you many sins and your dishonest trade, sanctuaries. Satan wants a sanctuary of his own. Satan wants to be worshiped as well as God. If he's truly gonna be a king and a God, he needs worshipers. 
In Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14, it says, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. The stars are angels. And he wanted to be above the angels and wanted them to answer to him. Do you know angels were not created to have dominion and to rule? They were created to serve. They were supposed to be ministers. The word minister means servant. And if an angel falls out of line with God, steps out of his law, he is a fallen star, a fallen angel. He is a lost angel. We have a city in California called the city of lost angels. I will persuade on, I will preside on the mountain of God's far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and I will be like the most high. So if he's gonna be like the most high, he's got to have his own laws. He's got to have his own jurisdiction and he's got to have his own character. He's got to have those three. He's got to establish his law, establish his character, and establish his sovereignty. And the reason he's got to do that is because Lucifer believed, Lucifer believed three things about God were unfair. Three things about God. He thought his law was unfair. He thought his character was unfair. And his sovereignty, his domain, his rulership was unfair. So working with mysterious secrecy, and for a time concealing his real purpose under appearance of reverence for God, he endeavored to excite dissatisfaction concerning the laws that govern heavenly things, intimating that they imposed an unnecessary restraint. Since their natures were holy, he urged that the angels should obey the dictates of their own will. For those of you who are familiar with, with high Masonic rules, or Luciferianism, there is a, a phrase that they use called do what thou wilt. The same phrase was used and, and, and set, set abroad by the, um, the Muslims in the 60s by any means necessary. It's the same phrase. Anytime we want our will and we're willing to do anything to get our will is the minute that we step out of the protection of God, we step out of his law, we step out of his character, and we step out of his sovereignty. Do what thy wilt by any means necessary. Satan sought to create sympathy for himself by representing that God had dealt unjustly with him in bestowing supreme honor upon Christ. He claimed that in inspiring to greater power and honor, he was not aiming at self-exaltation, but he was seeking to secure the liberty for all the inhabitants of heaven, that by this means they might attain to a higher state of existence. The reason he's called the serpent when he's sneaky, because serpents are sly. You don't see them coming. They make no sound. But then when he's in control and he can exert power, he's called a dragon. When you read the Bible, look, different times he's called different things. Satan closed close his intention with mystery so you can't see him coming. The only way he can deceive you is he, he makes himself look like God. Satan had been so highly honored that all of his acts were so clothed with mystery that it was difficult to disclose to the angels the true nature of his work. Until fully developed, sin would not appear the evil thing that it was. Hitherto for, it had, it had no place in the universe of God, and holy beings had no conception of its nature and its malignity. The angels had never seen sin. So the, the thought that somebody's going to go against God was so foreign to them, it snuck up on them. They could not discern the terrible consequences that would result from setting aside the divine law. Satan had at first concealed his work under a specious profession of loyalty to God. He claimed to be seeking to promote the honor of God, the stability of his government, and the good of all the inhabitants of heaven. 
while instilling disconnect, discontent into the minds of the angels under him, he had artfully made it appear that he was seeking to remove dissatisfaction. When he urged that changes be made in the order and the laws of God's government, it was under the pretense, under the what? The pretense that these were necessary in order to preserve harmony in heaven. Understand that deceit and rebellion are his trademarks. So often when you look at the perfumes, the perfumes are called Rogue. There's a, 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 um, a James Bond movie called Rogue. There's a, um, a, movie, a movie by um, Mission Impossible, Rogue. There's a character in the X-Men called Rogue. Rogue means rebellion. In his dealing with sin, God could employ only righteousness and truth. God was, God was required to play by the rules. Satan could use what God could not. He could use flattery and deceit. He had sought to falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government before the angels, claiming that God was not just in laying laws and rules upon the inhabitants of heaven. That in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. Therefore, it must be demonstrated before the inhabitants of heaven, as well as all the worlds, that God's government was just and his law is perfect. Sin had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper and his real object must be understood by all, he must have time to manifest himself by his wicked ways. When we disregard God's seal of authority, we too are signifying rebellion against his authority. We too, like Satan that says that God got it wrong. We join his camp when we make certain decisions. Satan claimed that he could improve upon God's plan. The discord which was, his, which was of his own course had caused in heaven, Satan charged upon the law and government of God. All evil he declared to be the result of the divine administration. He still blames it on God. If something happens to your house, if there's a hurricane or a, a hailstorm that destroys your roof, they call it an act of God. If there's a, a tidal wave that wipes it out or an earthquake, they call it an act of God. He has made it now, even in our insurance laws, that anything bad or catastrophic is charged to God. He claimed that it was by his own object to improve upon the statutes of Jehovah. Therefore, it was necessary that he should demonstrate the nature of his claims and show the working out of his proposed changes in the divine law. Satan had claimed from the first that he was not in rebellion. The whole universe must see the deceiver unmasked. When God says seven and we say one, we are saying God is wrong. When God says seven is completion and you say day eight is a new beginning, you're saying God is wrong. When you say one is the highest number and God says seven is the highest, then we're wrong. It's saying we have a better plan. What about sin on earth? What about the struggle here? Does Satan bring the struggle from heaven to earth? Lucifer questions the father's character on earth. In Genesis chapter three, verses one to five, it says, now the serpent was more subtle, that means cunning, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. First, the devil asked a question to undermine God. He wanted to plant the seed of doubt by asking a question about God. The woman responds in verse three, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The woman misquoted God. She didn't repeat what God said. God never said anything about touching it. She extended the word of God. First, Satan challenged it, and then mankind extended it. He says, don't add to my law and don't take away from it. In Genesis 2.16, what God said, so you know, Genesis 2.16 says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. 
Anytime somebody changes the word of God, they mix truth with error. 99% truth, 1% lie is a lie. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. God said you will die, serpent said you won't. Who are you going to listen to? God says seven, you say one. God says seven, you say any day don't matter. God says seven, every day feels the same. Verse five, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Man wanted to be like God, make his own decisions. And what kind of fool wants to know evil? Who wants to know cancer and debt and paying taxes? All of this pain over some fruit? Y'all think this was about fruit? This was about the misrepresentation of the character of God as he had practiced it in heaven. And Satan was causing people to view God as severe and tyrannical. Satan induced man to sin. And having succeeded thus far, he declared that God's unjust restrictions had led to man's fall. And they had led to his own, as they had led to his own rebellion. He blamed God for his rebellion, blames God for our fall. And he says that God didn't get it right. The Sabbath is a test of loyalty. And loyalty is about people who stay true to you behind your back. That's what loyalty is. When we do what God says when he's not standing over us, that's called loyalty. If we do it just because he said to do it, that's called loyalty. In Exodus chapter 16, verses 3 to 5, the Sabbath was used as a test of loyalty for God's followers. It says in Genesis, I mean, Exodus 16, verse 3, and it says, And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, granted, God had just delivered them from bondage for 400 years, taking licks. And as soon as he gets them out, they say, you brought us out to kill us. Disloyalty. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread down from heaven for you. And the people shall go out to gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. I may do what, everybody? I may test them. I want you to write this scripture down, Exodus 16, 3 to 5. This Sabbath commandment is the test commandment, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gathered daily. So the sixth day was the preparation day. Gave them twice as much on that day. Every day that they picked up the manna, it spoiled. Every day it spoiled in the evening, on the morning, they had to pick up new manna except for on the Sabbath. We'll pick up at Exodus 16, 22 to 23. And it says, and so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said unto them, this is what the Lord has says. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourself all that remains to be kept until the morning. We're going to go to Exodus 16, verses 26 to 30. The father shows him that no labor on the seventh day. He wanted to show that the seventh day was different. It says, six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that, that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. They went out to work and he told them, don't go work. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Exodus 16, 26 to 30. How long will you refuse to keep my commandments? He used the Sabbath day as a test of loyalty. And he uses it as a test of loyalty because none of us can see why it makes sense. It's like when your mama say, because I said so. That's why you do it. Not because it makes sense to you, because mama said so. We in our humanists say Sunday versus Saturday, what difference does it make? 
But the commandments are heaven's constitution, just like the, the Constitution of the United States says we the people, and it has a preamble, and it tells you why he why the Constitution was created. It says we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. That's what God wants with us, a perfect union. To establish justice, that's what God said his law is. To ensure domestic, tr uh, domestic tranquility. That's the last six of the 10 commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Don't murder, don't steal, don't co commit adultery. Don't covet. Domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense. If all of us kept the 10 commandments, I could leave my door open all night. Promote the general welfare. He says, do you honor your, your parents? I'll give you long life. He says, the fifth commandment is the first commandment of promise. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our prosperity, posterity. We do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Do you know that if you openly disavow the constitution, they can say that you are in treason, in treason? And here we are, we disavow the, the constitution of heaven, the Ten Commandments, and we do it willy-nilly with no sense of repercussion. The Sabbath states that God is sovereign and states why allegiance is due. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. When you see people recounting the Pledge of Allegiance and they have their hand over their heart, it is symbolic of something greater. The hand over the heart is symbolic of their loyalty to the country. The Sabbath is only symbolic of our loyalty to our creator. Exodus 20 verses eight to 11 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then it says, don't do any work. God turns his holy day into our holiday. It's a holy day, don't do any work. You know, just like when the holiday comes, y'all don't go to work. He says, this is my holy day. It says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. Anytime we have a holiday is to commemorate something. Fourth of July is to commemorate independence. Valentine's Day is to commemorate your love. Your anniversaries to commemorate y'all still together. Your birthday to commemorate you still here. He has a holy day to commemorate something. Heaven has a weekly holy day. A weekly holiday where we honor our creator. Now the law and creation. When we go to Genesis two verses one to three, it says thus the heavens and the earth were finished. It says he rested on the seventh day and God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. The law and creation, that should be more than enough for us to plant our flag on the Sabbath. But let's go into why is important to God. Why is the Sabbath so important to God? When you go to Ezekiel 20, 12, it says that the Sabbath is a sign. So I went to the dictionary to look up the definition of sign. So one of the definitions of the word sign is an action that conveys information or instruction. An action that conveys information or instruction. So in Ezekiel 20, 12, it says, moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign that means an action to convey information and instruction. What information would he be trying to convey? Information, I am your creator. Instruction, remember me. It would be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Now, my daughter is, is going on 20 years old. But when she was five years old and she was in school and she would be singing in kindergarten, as she was singing in the front, I would be in the back of the room and I would give her a thumbs up. That was daddy saying, don't be afraid. I'm here for you. You could do it. I give her a thumbs up. And there she is up in the front of the classroom singing her little uh, kitty songs. And she see my thumbs up and she would throw a thumbs up back to me. And it was funny. You can watch the whole audience looking at me and her communicating silently with our thumbs up. It was a sign. That thumbs up meant, baby, I'm here. Baby, it's all right. You don't have to be afraid. I got your back. It was our thumbs sign and eventually i did it so much other people started to recognize the sign she's up there singing and playing the piano i throw a thumbs up and guess what other people in the audience start to throw a sign a, a thumb up too they were joining in in the sign to let her know that we're all here for you 
God gave us seven as his sign. I also looked up in a dictionary and it says sign is evidence of something supernatural. A sign is evidence of something supernatural. That's one of the definitions. Ezekiel 20, 20 says, and hollow my Sabbaths, they shall be a sign. Well, what was supernatural about the Sabbath? It recognized creation. Let me ask you, when was the last time you created a world? When was the last time you made something from nothing? It's a sign of something supernatural. The fact that we didn't come from monkeys or apes or, or, or swamp creatures or extraterrestrials. It's a sign of something supernatural. I looked up again the word sign and it says it means identification. It is a means of identification. Your thumbprint, it's a sign of who you are. In Matthew 5 verses 17 to 20, he says, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. They are my sign. Whoever therefore breaks the one of the least of these commandments, my sign, and teaches men to get rid of my identification tag, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever does and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. His commandments, his identification. Remember, Satan's got his own set of commandments. He wants his own rules. He's got to establish his own kingdom. He needs his own sign. Sign is a means to communicate purpose. This is in the dictionary, not making these words up. Sign is a means to communicate purpose. In John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He uses his commandments to communicate love. And when we keep them, we communicate love back to him, to a street man. Another definition for sign says to mark or consecrate something or someone, a sign to mark or consecrate something or someone. But it was not merely to accomplish the redemption of man that Christ came to the earth to suffer and die. He came to magnify the law and to make it honorable. He wanted to mark it or consecrate the law. Not alone that the inhabitants of this world might regard the law as it should be regarded, but it was to demonstrate to all the worlds of the universe that God's law is unchangeable. Could his claims have been set aside, then a son of God need not have yielded up his life to atone for his transgression. The death of Christ in and of itself proves that the law is immutable, unchangeable, eternal. And the sacrifice to which infinite love impelled the father and the son that sinners might be redeemed demonstrates to all the universe what nothing less than this plan of atonement could have sufficed to do. That justice and mercy are the foundation and the, of the law and government of God. A sign. It is a visible signal or reminder. Sign. It is a visible signal or reminder. Exodus 31 verses 16 and 17 says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant, a perpetual reminder. It is a sign, a perpetual reminder between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. You take away the sign. The devil knows if he can get you off a of Sabbath onto some other day and say, all the days are holy, all the days are the same. I could worship any day. Yeah, you could worship any day, man, but you can't rest every day. And you can't worship and rest in alignment with his commandments. Because it's a sign. You do it in a different day, on a different way. You take away the reminder. You take away the sign. Could you imagine what kind of chaos we would have in the middle of downtown DC? We take away the street signs. We take away the street lights. There'll be accidents everywhere. Nobody would know when to go and when to stop. The Sabbath is eternal. For the new heavens and the new earth, which I shall make, shall remain before me so shall your descendants and your name remain. And from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. Isaiah 66 verses 23 and, sorry, 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. The Sabbath in end times, the Sabbath in end times. 
Remember I told you the Sabbath issue would start at the beginning and we're gonna end with that as the world is coming to an end. God's time. According to Daniel 7.25, Daniel 7.25, it says that some, somebody is gonna come, some, some entity, some power, some antichrist is gonna come and seek to change his times and laws. That's Daniel 7.25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. The fourth commandment is the only one of the 10 that deal with, deals with God's time. The fourth commandment is the only one that deals with God's time. Has the papacy tried to change the law? Well, the papacy actually changed three of God's laws. At least they thought to change three of God's laws. They got rid of the second commandment that says you should not make for yourself an idol. If they didn't get rid of this commandment, they wouldn't have people bowing down to images of Mary or St. Christopher or St. Peter or St. whoever. They bow down to these idols and they worship them. They had to get rid of the fourth commandment. They shortened it. Matter of fact, they moved the fourth commandment up to the third commandment and in their, in their, uh, the Catholic 10 commandments, they moved it, right? They moved God's commandment because they, they got rid of the second, moved the fourth up to the third. They also shortened it. God's commandment, as it reads, is the longest commandment, and they shorten it down to remember to keep holy the Lord's day. So in order to make up for the, the two that they wiped out, or the one that they wiped out and the one that they moved up, they took the 10th commandment and divided it in two. They took the 10th commandment and, and it says, you should not cover your neighbor's house, his wife, et cetera, et cetera. They took that one and divided it into two commandments and it makes up their ninth and 10th commandments. So now they still got 10. They omitted the second, shortened the fourth, divided the 10th commandment in two. Seek to change his times and his law. How has the papacy changed time? Changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, changing Sabbath keeping hours from evening to evening, from midnight to midnight. So when I explain to you what the Sabbath is, I've got to say from Friday sunset to Saturday at the setting of the sun, right? That's evening to evening because Rome changed the time from midnight to midnight to make it almost impossible for you to know when the Sabbath is. Now, Catholics admit that they made the change. The Catholic record um, from London, Ontario, can, uh, Canada, September 1st, 19, uh, 1923 reads, the church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. The, Conver the Converse Catechism of Catholic Doctrine says, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Remember, Rome, the empire did it, and the Roman Catholic Church is nothing more than an extension of the Roman Empire. The Bible says in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18, it says, I behold another beast. A beast in the Bible is a government or entity that stood against God. And I beheld another beast, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. Who was called the dragon? Satan. Satan wanted his own laws, his own rules, his own day. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell within therein to worship. So this entity that stands against God, he too wants worship. And the Bible says that he maketh fire come down from heaven. And I've heard people say that this means nuclear weapons. No. Nope. It doesn't mean nuclear weapons, because if you continue reading, it says by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Who was able to do miracles in the Bible? Jesus. So this is going to be some sort of spiritual thing that he's going to do. Miracles. That they should make an image to the beast. So if God said that his sign is Sabbath, the beast have got to have his own image. What is his image? Sunday, sun worship. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, they should be killed. So at some point, as we get ready to wrap up Earth's history, 
there's going to be a law saying we've got to keep Sunday. Right now, you're doing it voluntarily. But don't worry, there's a law coming. But if, if you don't sort of get in line with God now, when the law comes, it's not going to be any problem for you to just do what the government says. Won't be any problem for you to do Sunday. You're going to say, I've been doing it my whole life, and me and God get along just fine. Remember, it's a test of loyalty. And it says, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand. That means what you do, your activities, your work, or in their foreheads. That's how you think. And he's going to impact your ability to buy or sell. You take away a man's ability to eat, and he'll do whatever is necessary. The forehead symbolizes the mind. According to Hebrews 10, 16, it says, I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Forehead represents how you think. The hand is representative of work. In Ecclesiastes 9, 10, it says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, or wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. A person will be marked in the hand by the working of God's holy Sabbath or by going along with Sunday laws for practical reasons. I got to do it. It's my job. I got to do it for my family. I got to do it for my church. Got to do it for the pastor. The sign or mark for either God or the beast will be invisible to the people. So it's not a physical mark on your head. It's not a barcode. You will, in essence, mark yourself by accepting either God's mark, the Sabbath, or the beast is marked Sunday. The churches speak for themselves. These are churches, some of which that you are members of, they speak on the Sabbath. So I'm going to give you the references so you can check them out for yourself. This is called the Baptist Confession. It was written in 1893 by Dr. Edward T. Hitchcock. He actually wrote the entire Baptist manual. This is the page that addresses Sabbath. Dr. Hitchcock says, there was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It, it will be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week. And then he asked a pregnant question. Where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. So if you're on this line today and you are a Baptist, that is the confession of your church. Catholics. This is from James Cardinal Gibbons. In Faith of Our Fathers, the 93rd edition, written in 1917, page 58. James Cardinal Gibbons writes, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line, single line, single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which Catholics never sanctify. If you are a Catholic, this is your church's confession regarding Sabbath versus Sunday. Church of Christ. Robert Milligan. He wrote Scheme of Redemption on behalf of Church of Christ. Bethany Press, page 165. It says, finally, we have a testimony of Christ on the subject. In Mark 2.27, he says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. For this passage, it is, from this passage, it is evident that the Sabbath was made not merely for the Israelites, as Paley and Hestenberg would have us believe, but for man, that is for the race. Hence, we conclude that Sabbath was sanct sanctified from the beginning and that it was given to Adam, even in Eden, as one of those primeval or primeval, primeval institutions that God ordained for the happiness of all men. Church of Christ. Congregationalists. This is Dwight's Theology, Dwight's Theology, Volume 4, page 401. If you're a Congregationalist, you're familiar with Dwight's Theology. It says, the Christian Sabbath, in quotes he has Sunday, is not in the scriptures and was not by the primitive church called the Sabbath. Dwight's Theology. Episcopal, 
This is from your church. The Episcopals have a religious encyclopedia, volume three. It was uh, published by Funk and Wagnall in 1883. You can find this on page 2259. It says Sunday, Dia Solis of the Roman calendar, day of the sun, because dedicated to the sun, the first day of the week was adopted by the early Christians as a day of worship. No regulations for its observance are laid down in the New Testament, nor indeed is its observance even enjoined. You can find that. It's called Sunday, a religious encyclopedia, volume three, Funk and Wagnos, 1883, written by Episcopals. Lutherans, in the Asberg Confession of Faith, it is quoted in the Catholic Sabbath Manual, part two, chapter one, section 10. The Lutherans say, the observance of the Lord's Day Sunday is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. Methodists, Harris Franklin Rawl, in the writing for the Christian Advocate on July 2nd, 1942, which is an official document of the Methodist Church, this is what he writes. Take the matter of Sunday. There are inclinations in the New Testament as to how the church came to keep the first day of the week as its day of worship. But there is no passage telling Christians to keep that day or to transfer the Jewish Sabbath to that day. He says there is no passage, none. The Moody Bible Institute. Some of you are familiar with D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody. He's considered preacher to the world. He's considered to be one of the greatest preachers ever in the world. He was considered missionary to the world. Many preachers today still get their preaching certificate from the Moody Bible Institute. Dwight Moody wrote a document called Wade and Wanting was the name of his book, page 47. It says the Sabbath was binding in Eden and it has been in force ever since. This fourth commandment begins with the word remember, showing that the Sabbath already existed when God wrote the law on the tables of stone at Sinai. He says, how can men claim that this one commandment has been done away with when they will admit that the other nine are still binding? I repeat it, this is Dwight Moody speaking, not me. How can men claim that this one commandment, that's the Sabbath commandment, has been done away with when they will admit that the other nine are still binding? Presbyterian, T.C. Blake, Doctor of Divinity, he wrote Theology Condensed. This is the official document that preachers in the Presbyterian church use to, to say what their theology is on page 4, 474 and 475 by the T.C. Blake, his Doctrine of Divinity, Theology Condensed, Presbyterian. He says, until therefore it can be shown that the whole moral law has been repealed, that's the 10 commandments, the moral law, has been repealed, the Sabbath will stand. The teaching of Christ confirms the perpetuity of the Sabbath. Remember Luke 4, 16, it says that Christ went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as it was his custom. The teaching of Christ confirms the perpetuity of the Sabbath. Pentecostal. In the Pentecostal Evangel, August 9th, 1959, issue number 2361, page three, this is an official document of the Pentecostal church. It says, why do we worship on Sunday, question mark? Doesn't the Bible teach us that Saturday should be the Lord's day, question mark? Apparently we will have to seek the answer from some other source than the New Testament. David A. Womack is Sunday, the Lord's day. It is in the Pentecostal Evangel, August 9th, 1959, issue number 2361, page three. Let's end with the encyclopedia. Edie's Biblical Encyclopedia, 1890, page 561. This is a biblical encyclopedia. You can find it at any cemetery, in a seminary, 
<laughs> not seminary, any seminary, that's where the preachers are instructed. Any seminary is gonna have a copy of Edie's Biblical Cyclopedia, the 1890 edition, page 561. It says Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshiped the sun. The seventh day was blessed and hallowed by God himself and he requires his creatures to keep it holy to him. This commandment is of universal and perpetual obligation. Edie's Biblical Encyclopedia, 1890 edition, page 561. The Bible still stands as the truth of God. John 8.32 says, the truth will set you free. I talk about this so much, the Sabbath, because it will be a final sign. And nobody, many churches don't preach about the Sabbath. They don't talk about it. They don't lead their congregations to read Daniel and Revelation. They tell them, don't read it. And Revelation itself, it starts out in Revelation chapter one, verses one to three. It says that you'll get a blessing if you read Revelation. Revelation warns you of what's coming. Daniel warns you of what's coming. And so I, I try to tell a few people that this thing that God said is important. We've got to seek him while he may be found. Will the Sabbath save you? Absolutely not. Will any of the Ten Commandments save you? Absolutely not. The commandments, the commandments were never designed to save you. They're only designed to point out his rules and his instruction. That's what it's designed so you know what his rules are instruction. And his people will follow them. And they will not openly, intentionally, and maliciously malign his law. Because to malign his law is to malign his government. I want to be a citizen of heaven. What about you? I want to be a citizen of heaven. What about you? I've talked to you about it today. And now you know if you didn't know before. It is now incumbent upon you to study the Bible for yourself. Start in Genesis, go through Revelation, and see if what I told you today and over the last 29 days is true or false. Study it for yourself. Don't rely on your mama. Don't rely on the preacher. Don't rely on the guy on television with the mega church. Read it for yourself, man. Start at Genesis, go through Revelation, and see if his commands still stand or not. Listen, I'm going to open up the lines for any comments or questions that you might have. If you're on the internet, on Facebook, or on YouTube, you can type a question in. We'll open up the line for you as well or try to respond to it. While you guys are waiting to come in the line, if you're on the line, just hit star six. Listen, we're almost done. Two days and we're done. Tomorrow we do New Jerusalem. We do New Jerusalem tomorrow. That's where I want to go. You know, uh, Mahalia Jackson has a song talk about New Jerusalem, uh, walk in Jerusalem uh, and talk in Jerusalem. Uh. Maybe I'll play that song tomorrow. I can't sing like Mahalia Jackson. But tomorrow we talk about the New Jerusalem. That's where I want to go, where the streets are paved with gold, where there's perfect harmony. And, and there's, there's rubies and diamonds and jewels everywhere. And all day long, we get around and, and sit with angels who scream, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. We get to say hallelujah over and over again. I can't wait to get there, man. Can you imagine angels don't need to take breaths like we do? We have to take breaths. We got to breathe in oxygen. We just can't keep talking and holding a note when we sing. But angels don't have to take breaths. They can say holy and hold it for 100 years. Can you imagine holding the word holy for 100 years? We don't even understand what it's like to praise until we get to heaven. We don't know what praise is. We can't imagine what heaven is like. The Bible says, eyes have not seen nor ears heard, neither has it even entered into the thoughts of man what God has prepared for us. So tomorrow we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Listen, there's nobody in the queue. Let me check and see if there's anybody online before I bid you adieu. Let's see, let's see. I done talked for, for 40 minutes. Somebody got a question. 
Somebody got a comment. Well, look, we got comments online. We got a hallelujah. We got an amen. We got a mercy. Listen, somebody is listening. Somebody is listening. Listen, I'm grateful to be on with you guys today. Our transformation is almost done. We started this transformation with prayer. We did a, a extended prayer service. We prayed through the night. We started it with a fast. Because if you want exceptional change, you got to be willing to sort of say to heaven that I need you more than food. And that's why we fasted. Some of us are ending our fast tomorrow. We fasted all the way through this month. We first three days, we did just, just water. And then we did the Daniel fast up until now, which is just fruits and vegetables. But more importantly, the father says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your obedience. I want your obedience. That's the greatest sacrifice that we can give to him is our obedience. Every religion in the world wants to do something different. They want you to climb mountains and they want you to cut yourself and wear beads and, and say the one line over and over. They want you to repeat these things, these mantras over and over again. And he says, all I want you to do is obey. Let the world know that you're mine. Don't be ashamed of me. He says, if you're not ashamed of me, and, and you, you proclaim me before men, I won't be ashamed of you in front of my father in heaven. So don't be ashamed of the Sabbath and don't be ashamed to tell people and don't be ashamed and afraid to honor his day. Just because the whole world is doing something different doesn't mean you follow the whole world because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. Remember when we started out, it says in the Bible that the devil has deceived the whole world. So, of course, the, the whole world is going to be doing something different. But I want to do what Christ did. He's my example. With that being said, everybody, we are officially done today. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, don't miss tomorrow. If you have not gotten on the Internet you know, any day up until now, those of you who are on the phone, get on it tomorrow. Mr. Dormer has worked around the clock. Listen, this dude is... So sleep deprived, <laughs> but he's putting a lot of work. So you definitely want to see tomorrow. Join us tomorrow here, same time, same place. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this journey through your word. We thank you for this transformation. Thank you for changing me. Thank you for changing all who took the time to hear and to listen. Those who took the time to watch. Those who sacrificed time, who sacrificed food to be transformed. We pray that you honor their sacrifice, Father. And I pray that you save us and that we all make it into your kingdom. We ask these and so many more blessings in your holy son, Yahshua's name. I mean, I mean, and I mean again. With that being said, everybody, today's call is officially over. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. For what would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's call is officially over. For those of you online, take care. We'll see you again tomorrow as we get ready to wind down and end our 30 days of transformation. Tomorrow we do New Jerusalem, and then one more day we do the recap.